Well, welcome everybody. How are we doing today? Welcome 26 West Church, man. It's good to be here together with you uh, to worship here this morning. Um, as people are still walking up, let me go ahead and ask you to do this. Let's go ahead and stand together as we move into a time of uh, worship and lifting up the name of Jesus together. Um, but I want us to do something. Um, I, I have had this sense this week that the Lord is doing a lot of work in individuals' lives here, um, but also that he's doing something uh, in the life of this church. And I don't wanna just breeze past that as we start this morning. So I just wanna give us a second <clears throat> um, to just posture our hearts before Jesus so that he can do whatever he wants to do in this space. Um, but let's do this. If you would just like close your eyes with me for a second. Just close your eyes. And let the reality that the, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the creator of the entire universe, the very tangible things that we see and the spiritual things that we cannot see, he is in this place. God, we thank you that you meet us here, that you are here with us, and that you have a work you desire to do in our hearts. And so we receive what you want to give us today. Church, let's just extend our hands out as a physical expression of what our hearts are saying here this morning. God, we just want what you want for us. Don't let us miss what you're doing because you are here and you are powerful and you are on the move in this church, in the life of this church, God. We know that you, you want to use people in this church to do mighty things for your kingdom. But we also know that in this space, there are people that are hurting, that are wrestling through really hard seasons. And there is hope that you want to offer them. And we find hope in your character and in goodness in your promises to us. Lord, we thank you that you use all things together for our good. That you teach us through difficult times. That you bless us in, in rich seasons. But through all seasons, there is one thing that is true and that's you are here. Your presence is all around us. And so God, we thank you that you don't leave us and you don't forsake us but you desire for us to live lives of discipleship and apprenticeship to you, learning from you, that we don't have to have it all together, but you will help us be made more holy each day. And so we just receive whatever you wanna do here in this space, Lord. We just say yes, we thank you for it. And we just pray that this time is just glorifying to you and that you would meet us here, God. We know that you will. And so we worship you.
brush of light and cling to The king of love had given up his life yeah. There on a the cross they made for sinners For every curse is blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn What sacrifice was made As the heavens roared
Thank you for this morning that we get to gather together and we get to be family with one another. So we just thank you for what you're going to do in this next hour, the people we're going to meet, the encouragement that we're going to feel. 
through your spirit, through each other. And I just pray that you would speak through to and through all of us. We love you so much. And everybody said, amen. Awesome. How are you guys doing this morning? Good, good. Hey, kids, you can go to your classes and everyone else say hi to one another. Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather going to be like? How am I going to fit everything in? But then there are those bigger questions, like why am I here? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with, is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. At 28, I had gotten many of the things that I thought I wanted. You know, my girlfriend was on the cover of magazines, I had a Beamer, and I was so unhappy. It was a realization maybe that I would, I would never find happiness where I was looking for it. I think for so many years, you know, I always just strived to be strong in myself. All I needed was me and my buddies and, you know, we'd be like invincible. But the truth is, none of us are. I found purpose, I found meaning, I found hope. God took something so broken and made it a beautiful art piece. 
Alpha is a place where you can be yourself. You can say what you think and challenge everything. No, no question is too complex or too simple. And what your point of view is, is as important as anyone else's. We are going on a journey together, an adventure to explore the questions of life, faith, and meaning. Good morning, church family. How are you? Well, I'm super excited about Alpha. Uh, this has been three years in the making for our church. Uh, Jose and I, my name's Ryan, by the way, I'm the youth pastor here. If we haven't met and if you're new, welcome. Uh, but Alpha is an incredible journey, an opportunity for us to invite neighbors, friends, coworkers who are looking for hope who have questions and are wrestling and want to find answers. And we sit next to them every day. We live next to some of them. And this is a beautiful opportunity for you to extend an invitation to come into a safe space to wrestle with questions and to find the hope that we all know is only found in Jesus. And I just, I've been a part of Alpha and what it's done and how it transforms lives. And I just can't tell you how neat it is, and I'm so excited for what it could do for our church to have this tool and resource and invite the Holy Spirit to do a work in people's lives in the 26 West Corridor. So if you are like, I still don't get it, what is Alpha? If you are a disciple of Jesus following him, this isn't for you. But if you know of someone or you're sitting here and you're wrestling with faith and doubt and questions, or again, you have a neighbor, coworker, uh, who has those sort of questions, this is something to invite them to. And we encourage you to do that, to get them to register, to come with them. Alpha is going to be an eight-week course where we get to ask those tough questions and wrestle with them. But we do it over a meal, over conversation, and it's a real safe space. And so we just encourage you, either one, invite someone, or two, just join with us in prayer um, the way that we teach Alpha and the way that Alpha is taught is that this is not a silver bullet to get people into the kingdom. We are really praying at, that the Holy Spirit would do a work. And so if you aren't inviting someone or having someone that's coming, we are asking you over the next eight weeks to join us in prayer that God would do something transformative in people's lives. And we're just excited for what this journey could be for our church and seeing some new life. Sound good? Just a couple more things for you. Um, tonight, we have an incredible opportunity. It's our last women's gathering of the year. So if you uh, have not registered yet, there is an amazing guest speaker that we've invited in, Wendy Palau. She's one of the lead evangelists for the Palau Association. She's uh, married to Andrew. Uh, and they are an incredible couple doing incredible work around the world. And Wendy is coming tonight just to share from her heart and share some of her experience. And so if you haven't registered for that yet, please do so. It will help the team prepare as best they can for tonight. But we just would love to have you. So carve that time out tonight to come and, and be together. And then lastly, uh, basics. If you are new to 26 West Church or you've never been a part of our basics course, this is an opportunity for you to come and learn more about what does it mean to be a part of 26 West Church? Who are we? And it gives us a chance just to learn more about you. We are a relational church, and we want to get to know you and help you connect and grow. So you can register for that right now, even if you haven't yet. Or if not, we've got extra food. It's going to start right after the gathering this morning. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Oh. <laughs> My friend Stephen here just getting wired up. Hey, let's give Stephen a hand as he comes to share the word. <laughs> Sorry. I wanted to make it interesting as I came up here, right? Uh, I hope you guys are doing well. My name's Stephen. I'm one of the pastors here, and one of the hats I wear is overseeing our community groups. And if you're not in one, I want to encourage you to take that step. And if you're like, I don't even know what to do, come to basics. We will take care of you. But this morning, we are in week two of our series, Turning Point. And this series is about looking at key moments in Scripture where there is change or transition and turning points in the people of God. That we'd learn from these moments 
so that in the midst of all of our changes and turning points, we'd be spurred on to faithfully follow Jesus. See, our prayer is that this season would be a true turning point in all of our lives as well, that we'd see new growth and new life in Jesus. I want to say, like, that's why we're here. (laughs) We don't just come here to sing some songs and listen to a guy talk and and get some updates. We come here because we believe that God is alive and that he's on the move and his word is still speaking and is living and active today. We come here to be transformed and changed and molded more into the image of Jesus. We are never just going to church. We come here to encounter the living God. Uh, but I can't conjure that up. So I'm going to need to pray and invite the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do. So let's, let's pray even just a prayer of dependence right now uh, uh, in our time to kick this off. So Jesus, we thank you that you are alive. We thank you that your word is alive. We thank you that we are gathered here. We all gathered here, not just to sing some songs and listen to a message. We came here to meet with you. We came here because we know we need you. Even if we can't quite articulate that, we came here for a reason. We are not here by accident. We are here today to hear this word and sing these songs and encounter you, the living God. And so, Lord, uh, we just invite you to have your way in this place. Uh, I prepared something, but, Lord, we we just ask you to do what you are going to do in this place because your ways are higher than our ways. Lord, so we surrender to you in this place. In your name we pray. Amen. To kick us off, i got a question. Have you ever had one of those just evenings where things go from like bad to worse? Just like a spiraling evening, if you had one of those. Well, my parents had one of those about 30 years ago. I was about four years old, and my brother was one year old. And uh, what had happened is, you know, those meals where uh, my parents decided they're going to make us all spaghetti. But a spaghetti meal turned into what looked like a massacre scene, right? When you've got a four-year-old and a one-year-old. My brother had just gotten spaghetti everywhere. He didn't know if this was a murder scene or dinner, right? And it's going on. And he reached the point where uh, every parent knows this with little kids, that you reach a point where wipes are, are futile, right? It's like, we need to go take you out back and hose you off. Like, there's no amount of wipes that are going to solve this. We had reached that point, right? So my mom mom gets my brother to go put him uh, into the bathtub, right? And so, and then I decide as a four-year-old, you know, it sounds fun. Let's turn the spaghetti leftover into a slip and slide. So I'm like running everywhere, making a mess, making, making it worse. And I'm going to like slip and fall. So my dad's like, hey, stop, get in your room and just stop messing with this. And so I decide as, I'm, as I've got this carbo, you know, energy load going on, I'm, I'm, I'm strung out on spaghetti here, that I'm like, all right, what are we going to do? I, I got my bed, and I'm just, I'm jumping on it, and I'm jumping and doing this maneuver where I'm jumping, landing on my stomach, and then popping back up on my feet, and I think this is, this is fun, uh, but I'm not a gymnast, right? I'm a four-year-old, and so I don't have all the coordination uh, that, that, you know, you should be having to do this, so I have a wood-framed bed. And so some of you know where this is going. I told you this is going to go from bad to worse. And so I jump, and I just jump too far, and I hit my arm right on the edge of the wood bed frame, and I acquire a second elbow as my arm snaps in upward. I start screaming, and my dad says, my dad runs in the room, he's like, what's going on? And he's like, Nancy, that's my mom's name, Nancy, Stephen broke his arm, get in here. And uh, my mom's sitting there be like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, what do you mean he broke his arm? Like, uh, and let's be honest. My dad actually is not a dramatic man, but uh, uh, apparently I did not uh, acquire his uh, genetics. But, uh, you know, when, when, when I, why are you laughing? Uh, <laughs> you can picture me being dramatic is why. So here's the deal. Uh, when, whenever my kids, like, bump their head, you know, do something, I, I'm like, Kelsey, call the ambulance. Like, I'm like, this is a full-scale alarm, right? I think a lot of dads are this way, where his mom comes in and it's like, it's a bruise. It's going to be okay. No, my mom walks in. And he's like, you weren't joking. Again, second elbow, arm sticking up. She's like, oh my gosh. She runs back in to go get my brother out of the bathtub. And my brother decides, you know what this night needs? Let's just crank the sucker up and decides to just take a dump all in the bathtub. <laughs> so at the moment, we have spaghetti massacre. We've got second elbow boy, me, with a, a gumby arm. And then we got, we got an absolute bathtub blowout. And uh, you could say uh, this, this evening went from bad to worse to what is going on. Things have spiraled out of control. And you can pray for the trauma of my mom and dad. Uh, and today what we're going to be looking at is a book of the Bible that spirals out of control and things go from bad to worse, to utter disaster. We're actually looking at a tragic book of the Bible. We're looking at arguably the darkest and most destructive chapter of redemptive history. We're looking at a book of failure, and yet there is this glimmer and thread of hope. And that book is the book of Judges. 
See, today I got three big picture movements and my prayer is that we'd see judges actually as a warning from God that will spur us on to faithfulness to God. Uh, there's a reality of you can learn the stove is hot by not touching it, right? You can just learn it and you can take people's word for it. Some of y'all, you're like, I got to touch it and find out. Let's not do that here today. Let's learn from judges that uh, we don't need to learn the hard way, that we can learn from judges as failures so we don't repeat them, but instead experience a true turning point and walk in faithfulness to Jesus. So I got three movements. Number one is the failure to remember. That's what we're going to look at first. So if you got a Bible, you can start turning to Judges 2, verses 8 through 10. It'll be up on the screen if you don't have one, but if you don't know where Judges is, just use your table of contents on an app or on your Bible and you can get there. So Judges 2, 8 to 10. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timon Therese in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. So last week we talked about Joshua, who's the descendant of Moses. He's like this, he's he's the second leader after Moses. He's the one that Moses handed off his leadership to. And Joshua is calling Israel to be a people of the book. Joshua led the people of God into faithfulness. His famous charge of, you might remember if you grew up in the church, of choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And Jose last week challenged us to be a people who echo this commitment to God and echo this commitment to his word. And today uh, we see Joshua, he dies. And that really is the beginning of our tragedy unfolding. And that last line is telling of that verse. Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. We just got to ask, what happened? See, the generation of Joshua followed the Lord, but they did not pass down their faith to the next generation. Past faithfulness does not guarantee future faithfulness. Past faithfulness does not guarantee future faithfulness. They didn't teach the next generation about the Exodus, about the great acts of God rescuing his people from Egypt. They didn't pass down the law to their children and have them write it on their hearts as God commanded them to do. So this new generation did not know God and did not know his works. And this is tragic. It's, it, Moses' grandchildren don't even know what happened. It's tragic. See, the most frequent command in Scripture is to remember. I don't know if you know that, but the most frequent command in the Bible is to remember. And it's that for a reason. Because the old hymn, as it says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. We don't drift towards faithfulness. We drift towards forgetfulness. If if you got notes, you can write that down. We don't drift towards faithfulness. We actually drift towards forgetfulness. And if we're going to be faithful, we must be resolved to remember. We must be resolved to follow the Lord. And that's everything that Jose talked about last week. But we also must be resolved to intentionally pass down our faith to the next generation so that they can remember it as well. And I think what's interesting about this is when we talk about passing down our faith, as we talk about remembering, as we talk about helping the next generation follow the Lord, I think we're actually quite good at this in other areas of life. I think we're actually really good at this. Uh, I'm a big sports fan. Uh, The NFL started last week, which I want to say the Lord reigns. Uh, It is is good. It is good. Here's the deal. My uh, my Seahawks on Monday night gave me a cathartic. They gave me a therapeutic uh, experience. Uh, I would say to the Bronco fans, I'm sorry, but I would be lying. I'm not sorry at all. I actually am very, very happy about what happened. And and you might be sitting there like, Stephen has a problem. I know I have a problem. And you should pray for me. <laughs> but, but when talking to people and you ask them, you know, what, what NFL team do you like? You know, what sports teams do you root for? And they might, you know, they might say, oh, I root for the 49ers. I root for the Cowboys. And I would say, those are bad decisions. It's not too late to repent and walk in the light. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter what team you say, right? It, usually what follows right after is, is a lot of times the same thing. You say, oh, I'm, I'm a whatever fan. And I'm not, oh, because my family is a XYZ fan. Or uh, my dad was an XYZ fan. And I'll tell you, that's my story. So many people, that's their story. I didn't grow up anywhere near Seattle. I grew up in a little town. You get gasoline on the five in Northern California. My dad grew up in the Pacific Northwest, and he passed down his fandom to me. And then now I'm passing down my fandom to my kids. On Monday night, my uh, four-year-old had a big old oversized Seahawks helmet on and jersey, and my one-year-old was running around in a Seahawks, you know, bib going on. So we're, we're passing this stuff down. 
But the irony is, we talk about handing things down, is there's no school for the center of fanaticism and fandom, right? U uh, of O might be trying to get close to that, but I don't know. There's, there's, no, there's, no, uh, there's no school for this. There's no, no center for this. There's no curriculum or course for this. But we know exactly how to do this. We know exactly how to pass our fandom down. There's rituals to fandom. There's practices and rhythms on game day. There's special food and drinks to celebrate this, right? It's wings and beer. It's, it's burgers and Coke. Nobody's having kombucha and salad watching Monday Night Football. It's like, what do you got in the cooler? Oh, it's granola. It's like, I was like, Portland actually might, <laughs> but, which is why, why do we keep losing? It's like, well, Alabama, they got fried chicken. Here we got granola. It's like, well, no wonder we're not winning. Uh, it's, here's the deal. Got some good hummus, right? It's like, <laughs> great. Can't wait. Uh, there's set apart time, right, to pass it over. The, the, the calendar's guarded. You wear special attire. You say special chants. You tell stories of old. You know, you remember the players, the games, the successes, the failures, the heartbreak. You sacrifice money and time, right? And invest in experiences. You're, you're part of a community that holds on to these same practices and values and history. It forms you. It creates allegiance in you, right? And becomes part of your story. And I would argue that for many of us Americans... We're better at handing down our fandom than we are at handing down our faith. I'd argue that for many of us Americans, we're better at handing down our fandom than our faith. And my goal here is not to lay down a load of like, guilt or anything like that. I just told you, I'm doing these things with my family, it's a gift from God. It's, it's part of just enjoying his good world. But what I want to do in this place, I actually want to inspire us and encourage us to think intentionally and to see today as a turning point. Of how do we actually not walk in the way of judges, but actually walk in the way of faithfulness, of handing down our faith? But the question is, how do we do this? Uh, but what I'm going to argue is actually really similar to a lot of the things that we do naturally with sports. We also must adopt rhythms and practices and habits that enforce and enrich our faith in Jesus. We must tell stories, remember the good news, be fluent in the works of God, in the scriptures and in our own lives. We've got to be fluent in the character and in the work of God. We must immerse ourselves in the community of God, guard our calendar for time with God, and invest resources into nourishing our faith in God as well. See, we pass down a faith when we talk about it, when we set apart time for it, when we get intentional about it and sacrifice in light of it. So I just want to paint a picture here. I, mean, I just, uh, just want to take the time I think needed to unpack this. I want to paint a picture for us this morning. Imagine what it does to our kids, to our grandkids, to our nieces, nephews, if burned into their brain, just as long as they could remember, is, is when they came out of the room. Picture your kids when they come out of the room, and first thing in the morning, they come on down, come down the stairs, and what they do is they see mom and dad, maybe they see grandma and grandpa, reading their Bible, praying, Every day, just a commitment, a resolution to be with God. What does that do to our kids? That day after day, burned in their memory, is the first thing they saw is mom and dad were with Jesus. What does that show to them about what the priorities are in life? What if around the dinner table, they have a thousand memories of reading scripture, doing devotionals, praying for one another, having family worship, and making it normal to talk about Jesus, making it normal to submit our lives to Jesus, making it normal to see all of life through the lens of Jesus. What if just, because we're not just doing things in the morning, but throughout the day, we're, we're giving our children a muscle memory of surrender to Jesus. That just day after day, we're bringing up Scripture, bringing up Christ, bringing up just situations. We're, we're pouring into our children, taking all of life through the lens of Jesus. What if we have a catalog? What if our children had a catalog full of sweet memories, bursting with joy and intentionality and life and fun, savoring the Sabbath? Where the best day of the week was a day full of meaning in God, enjoying God, enjoying God's world, enjoying God's people. A day where mom and dad, they were present with God, but present with one another where we slow down to be with God and to be with one another, where time with God and his people was the best day of the week. It wasn't a chore. What if our children have a decade of memories of mom and dad putting their faith first by choosing community group over soccer practice one day a week, where they say, we support you, we love you, son or daughter, but Mondays we pray. Mondays, we gather with a community group. Mondays, we open the Bible. Mondays, we surrender to Jesus and we encourage one another. So sorry, we can't be there for that game. 
What does that burn into our children about what are the priorities of life? What if, what if just into our kids' memory is seared that baseball is great? I played high school baseball. I was, I was high school good. You know, I played all kinds of tournaments. But there's one thing we didn't do. We never played tournaments on Sunday. I miss those games. And I'm thankful that my parents set up that level of dedication and a line in the sand that said, no, Sundays, the priority is we're with Jesus. We're with his people. And I'm going to say, if you, if you make these decisions as parents, you're going to get pushed back. Your kids might not fully understand it at first. You're going to have other parents saying, what are you doing? You're neglecting your kids. You're not giving them every opportunity. But I'm going to say, what is this actually doing to our children to see life through the lens of Jesus? Of what are the priorities in his economy? What if Sundays, you know, we say Sunday morning Seahawks games, they're great. Yeah. But that 10 a.m. start times mean we're either recording the game or we're just going to watch the second half. Because the Seahawks take a backseat to the Savior. And I would say, what if our teenagers remember that shaping decision you made? That that Wednesday night, you know, AP test study group. It's good. Scholarships, they're a blessing. Praise God. But youth is Wednesday night. And that's the priority. Because we care more about your faith than your academic or your athletic career. See, as parents, our primary goal is not to help our kids get college scholarships. Our primary goal is to help them get the gospel and be committed to Jesus. Our primary goal is not to get our kids college scholarships. It's to help them get the gospel and be committed to following Jesus. And I want to say, like, this is hard. These are not the waters we're swimming in. And I don't stand above anybody. Uh, These are the waters I'm swimming in. But would we be a community that is committed to teaching our kids that following Jesus is not a one-time decision, it's a lifestyle. It is a way of life. It is a daily decision where we must commit to putting Jesus first. And I think when we do these things, this picture that I'm painting, it shapes our kids to see that faith in Jesus is not just some add-on to our life. It is the center of our lives. We need to understand that Jesus, he is not asking us to make room on our plate for him. He's inviting us to give him the plate. He's not inviting us to make room on the plate. He's inviting us to give him the plate. And where the sports imagery falls woefully short is there's not a season of life to our faith. There's not a season of the faith. It is a life of faith. We tracking? You with me? I, before we move on, I've got to take one aside here. And that's, this, this is not some mechanical formula. Like, if you do enough family devotionals, if you just, you know, do enough, if you sing low songs in worship, if you just intentionally disciple your children, they're just going to foolproof follow Jesus. They're just going to love them. You know, we can think of that proverb that says, train up a child in the way he should go, and he'll not depart from it when he's older. I want to tell us, that's a proverb, it's not a promise. It's a proverb, it's not a promise. And the difference is, that's the normative pattern, that is the way it typically goes. But sometimes that doesn't happen. And I know there's a lot of pain in the room. We got those doubt cards, you know, from a few weeks ago. And there was a ton of those cards of just pain of my adult children aren't walking with Jesus. And we want to say that we lament with you, we pray with you. But may our cry never be that we didn't remember God and train up a generation to follow him. May our cry never be that we just didn't tell them, that we didn't intentionally raise them in the way of Jesus. So we can just take a step back, big picture. The first ingredient to ensure faithfulness failure is don't remember God. Don't remember what he's done and don't pass it on. And Israel sadly does this. And Judges begins with this failure to remember. And it sets the stage for our second movement. So number two, if you got the next slide, is the downward spiral. Uh, I'm going to read a large section of Judges here. So I just want you to stay with me and I just want us to kind of marinate in this uh, for a minute here. So Judges 2 verses 11 to 19. This is right after what we read. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. Those are the gods of Canaan. That is the land that they're in. It's uh, the land of Canaan, and Baal is a Canaanite false god. The people, they forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors who brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Asherahs. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. He sold them to the hands of their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them. And they were in great distress. And then the Lord raised up judges who saved them 
out of the hands of these raiders, out of the hands of these enemies. So just got to pause here for a second. Judges, when you think of a judge, don't picture like a Supreme Court justice with like a wig on and a big robe and a gavel, like tromping on the battlefield. Like think of, think of warrior leaders. Think of something more looking like William Wallace, right? Like think of more like a tribal chieftain when you hear judges. Um, these were warrior leaders. Verse 17, let's keep reading. Yet they would not listen to their judges. The people would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshiped them. They quickly turned away. They quickly turned from the ways of their ancestors who had been obedient to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. What this, what this section of scripture is showing us, what the entire book of Judges is all about. And there's this cycle that keeps happening over and over again. And I got an image here for us. And it's the image that, this, uh, that this, this whole series is really built around. And it's this cycle that happens in Judges. What happens is the people, they sin. They sin and they forsake the Lord. And then what happens after that is they are oppressed. They experience oppression from the neighboring nations. They, they adopt the practices. They worship the nations around them. And then they're actually oppressed by those nations. God hands them over to the nations. And what happens after oppression is they cry out to God. They say, God, we turn, we relent, we cry out to you, save us. And then God is full of mercy and he actually delivers them through the hands of a judge. And they experience deliverance. And then there is peace. But then what happens time after time again is we go back, then the people forgot God, and then they sin, and then they're oppressed, and then they repent, and then they're delivered, and then they experience peace. What happens over and over again is the judge dies and they forget God. Then there's deeper sin, deeper need, deeper rescue, deeper sin, deeper need, deeper rescue, and it's just this cycle that spirals out of control. That's what the book of Judges is. What we see at the beginning of the book of Judges, we see honorable judges like Ehud and Deborah. These are, these are violent stories, uh, but these are overall honorable judges. And then we get questionable judges like Gideon in the middle of the book. And then we get disastrous judges by the end of the book. Men like Jephthah, who don't know God's good law. They do not know who God is. And so what does Jephthah do? He sacrifices his own daughter, burns her alive, mirroring the violent horror of the pagan gods. We see uh, the, the people of God doing, uh, doing what the people of Canaan are doing to worship their God. They're adopting these false worship practices. We see the judge actually doing that. We see Samson, who's the embodiment of Canaan's idolatrous pride and sexual sin and violence. And at the end of the day, Judges is the tragic story of Israel's conversion from the way of Yahweh to the way of Canaan. See, Judges is the transformation and deconversion of a people. See, the end of the book of Judges leaves us with Israel in a civil war, committing atrocities, performing horrific sexual abuse. It is not for the faint of heart. The book ends with a people in total disaster. See, Israel is called by God to be a distinct people among the nations to live in a distinct way, to show what God is like. And they fail, and they look just like Canaan. And they suffer for it. The world suffers for it. And God's name suffers for it. See, Judges, it's, it's a turning point. But it's a turning point, as the graphic shows, of descent just downward again and again and again. See, Judges is a turning point but it's a turning point of individual and communal and cultural sin and rebellion and idolatry. Judges is a turning point, but it is a turning of warning. And I, I know this is a lot, but I just want to give it just a second. Like, let that hang. God gives us warnings in his word for our good because he loves us. And I just want to let that just sink in for a second. Just like everything we're talking about, the judges being this book of warning. I just want us to feel the weight. It's a lot. So that's Israel. But what I want to do is turn the camera back at us to kind of put a mirror up and look back at us because some of us, we feel trapped in the same cycles. We've been stuck in cycles for a long time and we just need to get honest here. 
Because we're not going to come here to this gathering and just put on a face and like, how are you doing? We're good. But inside, like we're just dying. Like we're not going to do this. Like we cannot experience healing if we're not honest with the physician about what's broken. Like the, st- the first step to healing is to acknowledge what's broken, what's really going on in our bodies. And so we just, let's just, let's be honest. Some of, a, some, some of you in the room, you're, you, you're looking at porn. And it's been the same cycle for a decade. You look at porn, you feel bad. You ask God to rescue you. You know, you, you get motivated to change. You, you maybe alter some behaviors. You put on a filter. And then some time goes by and life gets stressful. You feel lonely. Things get hard. Temptation inevitably comes and you're right back at it again. Then you feel bad. You recommit. You're motivated. That fades and then we're right back at it again. And the cycle's just been going on month after month, week after week, year after year. And that could be sexual sin. It could be yelling at your wife or kids. And it could be this cycle of losing your temper has just sent your life spiraling. It could be not having self-controlled drinking. And that's eroding your relationship with your husband or your kids. It could be shopping recklessly online. It could be an addiction to our screens. That's just eroding our souls. The list goes on and on. But for so many of us, we're stuck. And the cycle that we are in is not working. It's not working. I'm not going to ask you to put up a show of hands, but and do you feel that this morning? Do you feel like you're just stuck in that cycle? And like a car, so what do we do about it? And like a car that's stuck in the mud, the answer is not to just try to gut and grit your way out of the cycle. The answer is not like do better, try harder, you know, just floor it. If you're stuck in the mud, the answer is don't floor it. You're just going to dig yourself deeper into the ditch, right? You need someone to rescue you. You need someone to set you free. You need a tow truck to sew up to pull yourself out of that, right? Like you're not going to be able to get out yourself. You need someone outside of you to pull, your out, pull, pull yourself out, to get you out of the cycle. I don't want to say spoiler alert, we'll get there. His name's Jesus, right? Like the, the divine tow truck is Jesus. He's going to pull us out. But before we get to, to that good news, I think we also need to hear a collective warning here communally as the people of God. Because we have the same vocation as Israel, to be a distinct people among the nations, to live in a distinct way, to show what God is like. And the question is, are we faithfully doing our job? We just got to ask some, some questions here. Is the church known as a place of biblical justice, of radical mercy, of sacrificial love, of prophetic truth? Or is it known as a place of arrogant judgment? Is it known just as an extension of partisan politics? Is it known as a people of hypocrisy or as a house of scandal? The Hollywood in the house of the Lord, the people in power, just all looks the same. Scandal after scandal. And I want to say when we fail to live out our capital collective C church calling, when we fail to do this, we suffer. The world suffers. And the name of God suffers as well. So I just want to like, let us be warned by judges that this cycle of going in the way of the world, imaging the world rather than the word, does not lead to life. It actually leads to destruction. I was to say, this is a lot. Are you with me? Are you with me? It's a lot. I mean, so, there's, there's a reality of like, we got to be honest. I'm not going to make judges this like, ah, oh, and everything was awesome. Like, I'd be really unfaithful to the word if I came here and was like, let's all, like, isn't this just so, doesn't it make you feel good? Like, that's not what this, like, the Bible deals with reality. And there's things that when we look at ourselves, it's like, man, that ain't good. Man, that ain't right. And Judges points that out. And God loves us enough to actually bring that to the light. And say, we're going to deal with this in love. Not to, not to crush us, but to heal us, to redeem us, to restore us. But for good news to be good, it's got to invade bad spaces. And Judges has plenty of that. So we receive the warning from Judges. But we also, I think, need to receive good news from Judges. Some of you are like, yes, please, let, let's move to that section. <laughs> so I got two bits of good news from Judges. Uh, one, God is full of grace and mercy. Judges shows a God who is full of grace and mercy that time and time and time again, the people fail and God is full of grace and mercy. Judges is full of deeply flawed people who do horrible things and yet God uses them. And even in Hebrews 11, Hebrews chapters 11, some of these people that are even commended for their acts of faith. Like, and I want to say, if God can use a Jephthah and a Samson, he can surely use you. 
He can surely use you to do great things in the world and do great things in your life. If God can use Jephthah, he can use you. He can use me. <laughs> and, and the second thing I want to point out, be a uh, second bit of good news is God has given us his spirit. Throughout Judges, we see the spirit of the Lord filling these judges at critical times to help them free God's people. But here's the good news. We don't have to wait for a once-in-a-lifetime special anointing as the people of God. We actually have 24-7 access to the Spirit of the Lord. See, we, we have this because He's taken up residence in our hearts as disciples of Jesus. We have real power. We have real authority. We have real ability to change and to grow and experience freedom. You've heard me say this before. Greater is He who is in us than He who is in the world. And the same Spirit that, that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and gives you life as well. These aren't my words. These are the words of Scripture. We can have hope, church, for the Spirit of the living God is here. And if you put your faith in Jesus, He dwells in you. And you have 24-7 access to the Spirit of the living God. He's with you. Amen? So this big picture. We're looking at this big picture of what we're talking about here in Judges with this turning point. We see a failure to remember. We see the downward spiral. And the last movement here is we have the choice and the hope. Final words are important words, right? Final words are important words. They carry weight. And the final lines of Judges have an important word for us. It'll be up here on the screen. The final words of Judges, Judges 21, 25 says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Read that again. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. See, Judges shows us what happens to a people, a society, or a person when they simply do what seems right in their own eyes. See, the darkest days of Israel's history are when people simply did what they wanted. The darkest days of Israel's history are when people simply did what they wanted. And I just want to say, what a word to our cultural moment. Like, Judges has something to say to us in our cultural moment. I want to ask us, church, do you realize that the follow your heart, do what you feel, live your truth, is the oldest lie in the book? Do you realize that, like, live your truth is just another way of phrasing the very first lie that Satan told Eve in the garden? You can be your own God. Do what you feel. That serpent said, you can be your own boss. You don't need to conform to God's definition of good and evil. God can't tell you what to do. You're your own authority. You get to decide what's right and wrong. God's holding out on you. He wants to hold you back. You need to live your truth. Actually, if you don't live out your truth, you're actually oppressing yourself. You actually need to live out every desire you have. To not do that would be inauthentic to who you are. This is the oldest lie in the book. And today it might look like it sounds something like live your truth. You know, don't, don't conform to God's definition of justice and sexuality. Don't confine to God's definition of good and evil when it comes to ethics and truth. Live your truth. But I want to say that what Judges tells us, what the whole narrative of Scripture tells us, is that from this lie, it's the seed that sprouted every sorrow in our world today. This lie, it's dripping with allure. It's dripping. It sounds good. Do what you want. Do what you feel. Follow your heart. Our world is just proclaiming, screaming this narrative. But I want to say, it will only lead to destruction. It will not lead to life. And what we do is we, you don't take my word for it, we see that play out in a couple in Eden, and we see that play out in a people in Judges. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Just let that hang. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. See, there, there, there are two paths. There are two choices here this morning. There are two choices for every single one of us. Either obey Jesus or obey your heart. Either follow Jesus or follow your heart. I'm just going to pause there for a second. Like, parents, do you realize that every single Disney movie is telling your kids that the, the way they're going to experience life is to follow their heart? Like, almost every single one is like, the parents are idiots. They don't know what's best for you. You just need to follow your own heart because over that ocean is where your salvation is found. Like, you know, let it go. You just need to go over there. Like, don't trust them. They're holding out on you. You actually know what's best for you. Like, that is every single kid's movie out there. It's like, parents are dumb. Follow your heart. Like, that is the narrative. Like, and the question is, are we forming them in a counter-narrative that is actually the way to life is not follow your heart, it's follow Jesus. Like, and the question is, like, not just for our kids, for us. Like, do we actually believe, like, the way to our liberation is found actually in our autonomy? Or do we believe that our liberation is found in our surrender to Jesus? Because the choice before us is follow Jesus or follow your heart. 
Like, this is the choice I'm, I'm just giving. This is what the scriptures call us to. To do what Jesus says is right or to do what's right in your own eyes. And that's not just Disney. Like, this is all over us in our cultural moment. But also, like, man, I was in Arizona for a while. There's like a rugged, independent, hey, get off my land. Ain't nobody telling me what to do. Like, this is everywhere. Every single pocket of society has got this in our bones of I am in charge. You can't tell me what to do. And I would say that posture flies in direct contradiction and opposition to Christianity. Like, <laughs> this whole thing is about following Jesus, obeying Jesus, surrendering to Jesus. And I'll, I'll be the first to say, like, this is a hard word, but it's a word we need to hear that this, that this choice of follow your heart or follow Jesus, one leads to our life, for Jesus is the life. One leads to our freedom, for Jesus is the truth that sets us free. Or one leads to destruction. And again, this is a hard word, but true freedom is not found in autonomy or the absence of masters. It's found in being under the right one, the one who dies for you, the one who loves you, the one who seeks your good, and the one who's calling you to follow him. And his name is Jesus. As Christians, we fundamentally say, we fundamentally say, we are not our own. We are not our own. We do not run our life. Our cry on one unified voice is we belong to Jesus. My wife and I, we were talking about this last night, and she had this line. She said that, that like, because God created us, he has a rightful claim on us. We do not run our life. Again, the choice is follow Jesus or follow your heart. I want to encourage us to follow the one who says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He doesn't just say it. He dies for you. But this final word of Judges also gives us profound hope as well. I don't want us to miss this. Go, go back to that verse one more time. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. In those days, there was no king in Israel. But if you look at Judges, the next page is Ruth. The next page is Ruth. And from her line, a king is coming. A king is coming. And the good news, it doesn't end in Saul. It doesn't end in David. It doesn't terminate in Solomon. With the ultimate hope that we have and the ultimate hope for the world is that a king is coming. And the king has come. And he is the king of kings. And he is the Lord of lords. And his name is Jesus Christ. We have hope because we don't live in a day where there is no king. We have hope because we live under the lordship of Jesus who is alive, who is ruling, who is reigning and has put every single enemy under his feet through his death and glorious resurrection. Amen? Amen. We, we, we don't live in a day where there's no king. We live under the lordship of the king who right now is reigning. We have hope for a king has come. We have hope for this king reigns. We have hope for this king has poured out his spirit. And we have hope for this spirit actually empowers us to change. He actually empowers the world to change. And one day we will see from this king all things made new. Amen? See, the people of God and judges, they couldn't get out of their cycle. They couldn't get out of the spiral because they needed a new heart. They needed a new motivation. They needed a new life. They couldn't do it in and of themselves. They were stuck. And this is why the coming of Jesus, his death, his resurrection, his pouring out of the Spirit is the turning point that breaks the cycles of sin and ruin, church. See, when we put our faith in Jesus, the Spirit gives us a new heart. When we put our faith in Jesus, the Spirit actually gives us a new heart and replaces our heart of stone with the heart of flesh. That's just Scripture. And He writes the law on our hearts. He, like the Spirit, He doesn't just do that. He also gives us new motivation. That from this new heart, He gives us new appetites and affections. He changes our hearts to love and desire the things of God, the way of God, the Word of God. See, God, He actually puts a new heart in us, and that new heart has new appetites. Well, we actually crave things that are good for us, right? Like we actually, we don't crave things that are childish. We crave things that are mature. We actually crave that is which is life. And it's the slow process of sanctification, of becoming more like Jesus, is where we feed that appetite, where we actually grow to, to long for holiness and despise sin. See, the Spirit of God actually gives us new heart, new motivation, and the Spirit actually gives us new life. Jesus himself says that in him, trusting in him, we are born again. He says, behold, the old has passed away and the new has come. In him, you are a new creation. You are born again. 
The new has come. Notice that tense. It's not the new is one day coming. If you have put your faith in Jesus, the new has come. It is here today. We can taste it. We can experience it. We can have life in Jesus today. It's good news, amen? See, Jesus, he is the ultimate turning point. His spirit empowering us turns our whole life around. And in closing, the question is, what what do we do about it? (laughs) What steps can we take right now? I, I hope there's something for everybody here right now. First, the first step, like what do we do with everything I'm saying? What do, how, do we, how do we take the steps from judges? First, surrender to Jesus. Surrender to Jesus. Follow Jesus. That is the turning point. Put your faith in Jesus. If you've never done that, during our, our time of response, come back to the people that are praying in the back corner over here. They would love to pray with you to help lead you in that decision. That's not the only thing we got here. Second, let's commit today to being a people of the Bible. Let us commit here in this place to be a people that, that, that love the Bible, that lives the Bible, that gets in the Bible. Let, let us set our alarm 15 minutes earlier and, and get in the Word. Let, let us forsake that last episode of Cobra Kai, right? And like get in the Scriptures. We all got time. We all got time. It's just, are we prioritizing? Are we prioritizing this? The words of life. But let's not just get into it. Let's obey it. Not doing what's right in our own eyes, but what's right in God's eyes. See, we're not just looking for a one-time decision in Christ. We're not just here to, we just need to make people, all we care about is people making decisions for Christ. No, we want to care about discipleship to Christ. We, following Jesus is not just a one-time decision. It is a decision you're going to make every single day. Every single time you get up, we're going to make a decision. Am I going to follow Jesus today? We want you to make a decision for Jesus we also want to be disciples of Jesus. Uh, a few of us leaders, we were at a conference uh, this week, and uh, the, lead, the new lead pastor at Bridgetown Church was saying, they say it at their basics class, so I'm just going to say it to all of us here right now. He says, I want you to know this. We have an agenda for your life. He said, I want you to know, not in like some cult way, but like, I want you to know, like we have an agenda for your life. And the agenda is that we want you to walk with Jesus. And he says, if you come here and you have no desire to follow Jesus, walk with Jesus, and surrender your life to Jesus in all of life, you're going to experience a lot of dissonance here. But if you want to, through the struggles of life, through the pain of life, in all of life, surrender to Jesus and grow in discipleship to Jesus, you will thrive here. I want to say, like, the step second, let's commit to being a people of the Bible, commit to a people of discipleship to Jesus, who make a decision one time and then make a decision in all of life in light of that. Third Let's commit today to being a people that relies on God and not ourselves. That when the spirals of life come, we run to God. For he alone can empower us to break the cycle. And when we fail, as we all will, we run to God. As one pastor points out, religion says, I messed up, dad's going to kill me. Religion says, I messed up, God's going to kill me. Whereas the gospel says, I messed up, I need to call dad. The gospel says, I messed up and I got to call my father. Church, the father is overflowing with grace and mercy and love towards you today. Let's be a people who believe it and live all of life in light of it. And lastly, let's commit today to being a people who remember God's character and work and who pass it down intentionally to the next generation. Maybe it's starting a family devotional practice together. Maybe it's going back and listening to that Sabbath series and, and one day a week implementing a new rhythm. Maybe it's taking a, a step of faith in the middle of this crazy season and sign up for a community group and let soccer take a back seat one day a week. Whatever your step is, I, I trust that the Spirit is leading you in what your step is today. I got my steps. I was just talking to my wife. I feel like life has leveled up in difficulty. So I need to level up in my leadership. I need to level up in my surrender to Jesus. I need to level up in my discipleship. I don't know what your step is, but would we be a people who turn to God, who lead our families to turn to God and seek renewal in our city to see it turn to God for his glory, our joy, and the good of the world? And would today be a turning point to that end? Let's pray. Jesus, We thank you that you are the ultimate turning point. You are the ultimate turning point. You turn everything around because you died in our place and you rose again, conquering sin, Satan, death, evil, and destruction. And one day you're coming again to make all things new. And you call us in all of life to surrender to you because it's good for us. 
because it's the way of life. We want to experience life in you by making a decision every day to follow you. So Lord, help us to be healthy disciples of Jesus. Help us to not be the people of judges just going through this cycle. But let us surrender to you the cycle breaker who sets a new trajectory of our life. And the trajectory you set on our life is redemption. The cycle you set on our life is, 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 is renewal. The cycle you set on our life is eternal life. It's salvation. It's restoration. It's blessing. Help us to get onto your trajectory and not spiral into our same old patterns. Spirit of God, we surrender. We do not have the power in and of ourselves to do this. We need you. So we surrender to you in this place. And we say, Lord, have your way. And all God's people said, amen. I'm going to invite you now to stand. And we, we stand. It's really God's presence is here. And we stand out of reverence. Because when somebody distinguished walks in the room, you picture a bride going down the aisle. You don't stand, you don't sit as a neutral observer. You stand out of reverence. We're in the presence of the living God. We stand out of a reverence for who he is. So we're going to sing here in a minute. We're going to pray. If you need prayer, there's going to be people in the back that would love to pray with you about anything we're talking about. Maybe you're like, I, I just need to process some stuff. Let us go in the back and be a people of prayer. We're going to take communion here in a minute, but I also want to call us to, to giving as well. That giving is an act of discipleship. Jesus says where our treasure is, our heart will be also. Jesus calls us to give. And if you're new here and you're like, I, I want to, I just don't know how. On our website, you can click give. We use the push pay app. That's the way that you can start giving today. And we do this not in some like, manipulative way. We do this because Jesus calls us to. He calls us to follow him in all of life, including our money, including our time. So we follow him in this area. If you have uh, physical donations, you can give those in the back table as well. But this is just simply part of our discipleship to Jesus. We say all of life is all for King Jesus. So let us sing, let us pray, let us give, and let us here in a minute take communion. But I want to take this first song, just prepare our hearts to take the bread and the cup. So let us reflect on what we said, let us sing these words, and let's prepare our hearts to remember what Jesus has done for us. Let's sing. from hell 
God, we worship you. Jesus, you are worthy. So we just continue in the spirit of worship, just remembering and being reminded of all that you have done. What we're going to do now, church, is we're going to enter into a, a time of taking communion together, remembering as a family um, what Jesus has done for us. And so um, we're going to sing a song just after this, uh, this time of communion. And, and I wanted to uh, preface it by just encouraging you that um, before we look forward, which this song does, it looks forward to what we hope that Jesus will do based on all that he has done. And so we're going we're gonna to take communion to remember, and then we're going to worship and we're going to ask for him to do a new thing in this space. Not new in that it's not in the Bible or not in his character, but in this season of our, our existence as a human race, but also here locally in this place, in, this, in our cities and in this group of people gathered together. We want to sing together that we want to experience God in a fresh way. Amen? One of the things that, that is really um, important about life is these little Ebenezer stones, these moments that we remember. I'm a storyteller. I don't know if anybody else is like me, but I, I literally will walk you through the entirety of my life through about 8 billion stories. It's the way that I'm wired but I feel like it's been a gift for me because what it's done is it's provided resources to draw from to remember God's faithfulness in my past. We were at dinner with some friends last night and I got to share a really important story of a time that God met me in a very, very tangible way. And that has buoyed me throughout my whole life. But for us, I don't wanna just live in that space when I was a teenager. Does anybody in this space wanna experience a new, fresh, um, just have a fresh encounter with the Lord today. Does anybody want that? Well, let's pray and let's just ask the Lord to do it. And it's not about this space. This space is a special space because we gather together. But you can have this time, and I think one of the things Stephen was alluding to is to be a disciple of Jesus is to be at his feet, amen? It's not just to come into a service where we all agree on the same things. That looks a lot like a political rally, right? The difference between gathering and working each other up in emotions and the overflow of the Holy Spirit of God is that we have sat at the feet of the Father, made space for the Spirit to move through His Word, made space for the Spirit to move in our hearts on our own, and then we come together to remind one another of His goodness and His faithfulness, of His character. Because church, I need to hear your story and you need to hear my story so that we can be reminded that God is good. He is faithful. Amen, church? And so let's do this. Let's go ahead and you guys go ahead and make your way to the tables. Go ahead and grab the elements and then we'll come back together. We'll take communion and then we'll finish our time together worshiping in song.
So church, the, the Jesus that promises to return, promises to redeem us, to make this space newer and, and more, more beautiful and more right, to renew the earth, to renew the heavens. That same Jesus, um, he sat with the disciples and, and he offered them this hope that he would be returning, but that there was something that he had to do. And that thing that he had to do was the very thing that our faith is built upon, which is that his body was broken for us. It was beaten and it was hung on a cross, the cross that we deserved that he took on our behalf and his body uh, was, was broken and his blood was spilled for us, covering us from all of our unrighteousness and purifying us. And so church, let's remember what he has done and then let's go into a time of worship celebrating what he will do. So let's take together now.
Father, your word is rich and your word is for our edification and our building up. But I pray that you would help each one of us be transformed by the renewing of our mind in the presence of your spirit. As we sit before you, not just reading and looking for platitudes, but looking for you with our hands open saying that you are better that what you have for us is better. Make me believe this, Lord. We don't serve a God of ideas off in the sky, truths written on a, on a scroll. We look into those things to learn about the character and the person of our God, the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who is with us, moving in our hearts. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are leading us to truth, but also that you are indwelling us and changing us and moving in power over us to do things that we feel so ill-equipped to do, to love people when they feel unlovable, to forgive people when, when we have such a hard time forgetting, to boldly proclaiming the name of Jesus, not in in anger, def angrily, def just defiance in people's faces, but in humility as Jesus did. And so God, I just pray that for our people, that you would help us shift from subscribers to Jesus, believers in the true reality of Jesus. And you would let our knees be read from sitting at your feet, kneeling before you, sitting with you, and so when we, when we pray that we want a fresh wind of heaven, we want to experience heaven on earth, let your kingdom come here just as it is in heaven. God, we know that you will do transformational things in us, but also you will use us to do transformational things around us. And that's what we want. We want to see a day where pain and suffering are gone. We look forward to a day when there is no struggles, there is no trials, there is only celebration and marvel at the majesty of Jesus. Where we will have jobs and we will work to see the kingdom kept because you will give us the keys to the kingdom to have a space with you to rule and to reign. And so we look forward to those days. But in the meantime, we just ask that you would convince us that you are better and that our lives would just be sent, uh, spent just in your shadow, following you. We ask that in Jesus' name for your glory and for our joy. And the church said, amen. Amen. Well, it's been, it has been a joy to worship with you, church. Um, we look forward to it every single week. Um, and I don't always do this, but, but can we just be thankful? Uh, our team is volunteers, and they come and they give their time. Can we just give them a round of applause? <laughs> really appreciate you guys and want to honor um, your work um, in the church, in this space. But I also want to just encourage you that if you're interested in learning how to serve and what the church is about, we have a basics class literally in 10 minutes across the hall. Um, so even if you didn't sign up, there's plenty of food for you. Uh, if you want to learn about what this church is about and where we're going as a church, please go, go there and, and find, find your space. Maybe find your place to serve. Um, but also, um, in, in light of all of the amazing people serving, can we get some help uh, picking up chairs and, and collecting them so that we can make room for our women's gathering tonight for all of our ladies who are going to show up, if you wouldn't mind. But we love you, church. We're looking forward to, to going on a journey of faith with you, um, and we'll see you guys next week.